to see you. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> How fun. I'm, yeah. playing, I'm playing capsicums. I got to do something right now. It's 30 good. years of, of, of <laughs> we'll, we'll get to work together. Yeah. <laughs> well, somehow it's still happening. It's, it's happening and more and more and more because of the viral diseases. Yes, it's true. More people need to grow food. People have to have more access to understanding what the nutrition is about. So let's do it. We've been doing it 30 years. Can we talk to each other 30 years? Every once in 20 years. Goes, hey, you know what happened? I just talked to you and we just, but did you say any words? No, I read your mind. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. That's what we need to get back to. I think that the uh, mass communication has taken us a little bit away from, oh, yeah. you know, the, the telepathic communication we used to have. No, but no. it looks like Dave made it in here tonight. And so Chelsea. we'd like to welcome everyone online to our group tonight, the DEM Pure Educational Series. We're going to bring together some amazing people this evening, and we're going to talk about food sovereignty medicine sovereignty, seeds, safe seeds, what nutrient dense foods mean and what's happening in our area. Um, and um, tonight we're joined by Mushroom from Pea Seeds in Corvallis. I'm gonna let you talk about um, what you have going on there and Rich Pecorero from Masa Seed Foundation in Colorado. Beautiful Tamara, heal thyself down in California. And Dave, um, from Sweet Leaf and, and the OG plant, and is that Chelsea over there, yeah. um, out in Eugene? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I, awesome to see you all tonight. I've been, it's just been a really powerful series since we've all been, you know, confined and have been dealing with this, uh, you know, new reality that we're all in. We've, we've really gone to this co new communication of, of online and a lot of you all have been watching this and we've been feeling really inspired by, by all of the comments and all of like this beautiful ripple that it's created. And one of the things that people were talking about is that they really appreciated, you know, sort of opening up the conversation with a little bit of a prayer because it is reaching so many people. And we have the ability as this beautiful collective consciousness to truly change the world through thought and through heart. So I just wanted to take a minute to just, you know, think about our hearts right now. If we could just take a second and realize that we're all connected. We're all connected in this beautiful, amazing human existence in this realm of consciousness. We're, we're connected through heart. We're connected through love. Fear continues to separate us. That's totally useless in this time. So now as we focus in on our heart, let's think about all of the things that we have to have gratitude for. Everything that can just flood your mind right now with all of the things that we have gratitude for in the day and maybe the sunshine. Are you planting your gardens out there? Whatever that may be, being with your loved ones, connecting with your children more than ever, learning about health and well being, all these beautiful things that we have to have gratitude for. And then just send it out, send it out into the universe. Let's put one up in the air to everybody else out there. Thanks so much. Hey, Mushroom, let's start with you. Yes. Let's, 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 what's been going on with PCs? What's, what's happening? Uh, Lanaya Kaya. Do you know Lanaya Kaya? So much better here. There's a there's a four minute video from Nature called Lanaya Kaya, and if you let if you look at that, <laughs> what that too hard? <laughs> Something went upside down. You're coming in perfect. You're coming in perfect. We can hear your mushroom. Okay, I was I was sort of you know you reflect on uh, where we live and how old the planet is, and when human beings got on this world, and when, how every living organism got on this world, and what time reference sense about what the planet is, then you get to look at your solar system. When you look at your solar system and you find it's part of the Virgo cluster, and when you look at the Virgo cluster and you start to look at the 
the, the major attractor where most of the galaxies are moving in a collective view together in some place that we have no idea on earth with any religion, any person, any organism knows what really goes on in the cosmos. We now have access for the first time of all humanity to the structure of the cosmos and how it is that it is. What do I do in the backyard? Well, it's a lot of levels about, there's 420,000 species of angiosperms. So if you try to think about flowering plants and you think, well, maybe I should learn a little bit about them, you got the rest of your life and 1,500 more lives to put it together to be able to say, how do we improve the human food system? How do we figure out that amino acids that make all the proteins that we do? Right, this thing going on, it's an interesting aspect of the, uh, of the, of the virus that's giving so much uh, tragedy to our lives. You got this crazy virus, but the virus is an RNA virus. And so, and, and so that's one thing. And the next thing was, how many genes does a virus have? And no matter how much I've heard and looked on the internet or read or anything, nobody tells you how many genes the virus has, right? And how the virus has a connecting concept in its own evolution that allows it to insert in certain different genes. We've got 22,000 genes. Uh, uh, we got how many? 22,000 genes. No, we got a thousand genes for every chromosome. We have 22 chromosomes. We have 22,000 genes. Where does the virus stick its nose? We don't know. We don't seem to understand about how life inter intercepts itself and what it did. Uh, you know, I mean, human beings, about 10 million years. Right? Didn't they just find something? They just found a, a, something that was 75 million years old. Someone, we're, we're be discovering more about the actual existence of the organisms that made what we call, what do we call the planet? Do we call this a solar system? How, who's going to join and be living on Mars and going to be living on the moon? And who's going to be traveling into the next level of all the, the discussion about why? because Isaac Asimov a long time ago said, we're gonna need all the metals and all the materials to be able to develop all the computers and all the kinds of machinery that's gonna help us uh, hopefully uh, make a better world for all living organisms. Back into the backyard, the apple trees. A garlic mustard turns out in the morning, go feed the chickens, but pick some garlic mustard. Well pick some of uh, uh, the uh, precursor to uh, celery, uh, Smyrna molisatrum uh, from Europe. And some of these plants grow so remarkably well and all of a sudden they're green and they have, what does it mean it means green? Chlorophyll, right? Chlorophyll, what's in the middle of every chlorophyll? You got a magnesium, that's the metal. And said, right, did everybody know that their whole body's filled with metal? No, I don't wanna think about my, I'm not filled with metal. Everybody's filled with all these minerals and materials set up in chromosomes. And we don't even know how to take a virus and figure out what it is doing. Yet. Okay. Yeah. Why is that? Why, why can't we figure that out? What's up? I don't know why we don't figure it out. It's straightforward. A lot of people would think it's very simple when you start to look at it. About it's got you got chromosomes. It's got chromosomes. It's got pieces that fit into the things. This thing breaks it open and does and reseals it, and it doesn't work as well. So you can't walk, or you can't breathe, or you can't think, or you can't all the stuff that has to do with the integration of your insight of your mental vehicle, right? So one of the things, right? You got you got two chromos two hemispheres two hemispheres, yeah. right? Two hemispheres? Yeah. Do, do you think they get along well? They don't, huh? That's right. Interesting. Then there's a, what, 30, no, 200,000. How many different locations for memory, for remembering things? So the number of locations in our brain come from the different hemispheres and they, you know, it's like, Wow, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But then how do you get information that you can cross check to find out what 
but it's not what is just made up so somebody can have a fantasy so they can get a power trip so they can become the idiot of the world. So we'd like to change that kind of stuff and maybe have more intelligence like, oh, well, look at the look at the capsicums, right? And look at where they come from in South America and look at which ones can breed with which ones and what kind of characteristics you want that have some are very hot, some are very mild, some of but what does the flavor have to do with how good they are to being able to reinforce your breathing apparatus of how your lungs and how your chest expands and how your heart beats? All those things are interconnected, having to do with an understanding that we need to know more science. As a society, people and everybody, we need to begin to explore. And we are, because some people recognize, of course, we don't want to make war. We want to make peace as a reality in the lives we live. So we do not have so much bias, prejudice, ignorance, and give it credit for all the religious views that we have. When you look at Lanayakea and you look at the cosmos and you look at the Milky Way galaxy, which is our galaxy, and you've got 100,000 stars in our galaxy, and you have 100 trillion galaxies all being blown around in some kind of structure of existence that we have no idea who <laughs> built it, how it was built, what's going on, and we like to make believe we understand. Yeah. Yeah, mushroom. I mean, we could go so deep into all of it. And I feel like there's so much that we don't know. But I feel like one thing that we do know is that our immune response does have something to do with almost anything, you know, like whether we're going to, you know, receive a virus or a fungi or some type of pathogen. Let's just call it a pathogen. It, what, what kind of things can we do right now? that we can control, that we can like take a hold of our immune system and think and do like, what can we grow or, or what can we do in the backyard? Like people have these lawns that they've been mowing all these years. Maybe they can go in the backyard and plant a few things. Like how can we uh, coexist with nature more to, to build our immune response through that? You like to grow, you grow more stuff. You explore what's nice to grow, what's nice to eat. Yeah. And you read Jim Duke, the Duke <laughs> of Herbs. You read the Duke of Herbs, and he tells you about all the things you can grow in your backyard that you do not need pharmaceutical drugs to be able to get well. You can get well because you, what you grow in your backyard is not so much stuff that most people even know about. But the Duke of Herbs says, check it out. And you know, tomorrow that but that pretty much just rolls right into everything that you 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 work on and everything that you love and live. You're such a beautiful nature spirit woman, and in California, you know, introduce yourself, tell us uh, what's up, and and you're going to be talking about herbs and health and well being today. Okay. Hey, tomorrow. Bye. <laughs> hi there. Um, hi, Tamara from Heal Thy Self Gardens. I'm um, founder and co-owner now. There's another. We are a woman-owned and ran company. And uh, But what we're doing now is a lot of medicinal herbs and making medicines from them. Um, but a little bit of back background about where we come from or where I'm coming from is that I also like studied a lot of different alternative um, therapies and to a lot of vibrational medicine, to like emotional freedom technique. I got into um, massage therapy, yoga, uh, you name it. I've probably studied it between color therapy to hypnotherapy to um, Reiki to, so I'm coming at it now from that background, but then also getting into learning how to really take care of like this body, this material self and um, what that actually means. And that's kind of like what I've been learning the last 10 years of more physical like herbalism and these plants vibrations. But on all of that, it really, um, it really matters as like all of its vibration. Even if you're taking these plants in, they're just another vibration that it's holding. And it helps you if you take it in, it helps you hold that vibration, you know, and you keep holding it. And that's why it's good to keep taking it in, especially for 30 days. And you're able to like hold that more. But the same thing can happen with like going into yourself and like 
doing tapping and like working um, on other techniques to like feel good because our mindset is huge. It's like, if we're not feeling good, we could take all the herbs we want. We could go to massage therapists every like week, but if we don't feel good and our mind isn't like right, then it's like, you know, we're like, oh, this is horrible. We're, we're feeling bad then no matter what we do, we're going to get like well and be able to have those defenses that we need. So it's really, I feel like about like a holistic look of everything of like going outside and grounding and like putting your energy into the earth because we're electrical beings and going into nature, feeling the dirt, smelling it, like getting fresh, clean water. Like that's huge. And um, meditation, where you can just like sit and be still and um, allow those adrenals to drain and just like not be in this fight or flight. Because when we are in fight or flight, then our immune system goes down. It's no longer fighting that flu symptom. It's like going to like run, like we used to from cyber to tigers, you know, but we don't do that anymore. Now we're like always on these like wheels that we have to get this done. I gotta get this done, you know? we're always in this like really acute state of like hypertension, I think sometimes, or, um, and so it's like being able to release that and relax. That is, that is huge. Allow the stress to go down. And then our immune system can start working and start doing its job and healing ourselves. And, um, but, <laughs> and on all that, it's like, but there are really good, like what our cells do is they either like go towards something they really like or they're in protection mode, just like us. If like, we're either open or we're closed. And so our cells are like little mini versions of us. So it's like, we're either feeding it really good nutrient dense foods, telling ourselves loving thoughts, um, you know, grounding every day, sunshine, um, you know, like tapping out some really intense emotions, like really like, you know, feeding yourself, then your cell, you're healthy. Your immune system's like really high. But if you're not, then you're in protection mode and like, you're just not able to like, it's, it's hard for it to kick in to start healing that. So, but on that, so let's say you're in that fight or flight because a lot of us are and our immune systems are down. So what do you do? There's like certain herbs. I kind of like, you want me to go into this now or? Yeah, okay. just roll right in. Okay. okay. <laughs> There's like certain herbs I like wrote. Yeah. Okay. I was like certain herbs I broke down that I was like, what if like a person was in an apartment? Like, yes, yeah, so we have gardens. A lot of people have farms on here, but like, what if they just have like a front yard or an apartment? Like, okay, well let's do, there's like four really basic herbs. I could have done three, but I really like four. Um, but like thyme, oregano, rosemary, these are very like easy to grow. Like they don't care if you don't water it all the time and they like clean your air as well. And each of those that you can um, take as a tea and you can put them all three together. They're your food seasonings. You can get that in there continuously. You can put it in like olive oil so you can continue to get it on your salad and you're just getting these herbs constantly because they're all antibacterial, antiviral. They each have like their own vitamins and minerals in them. And um, so one of the best ways too, I found like, let's break it down like really basic ways to use these herbs. One, tea, just put some herb in a cup, pour some hot water over it, there you go. Let's drink it, maybe strain it. So after that, it's like doing a vapor steam. This is one of my favorite things. You just put like three times as much herb that you would um, and a tea and you boil some hot water, put that over it, put a towel and you're just breathing that in. And as you're breathing it in, it's clearing any mucus, it's allowing your lungs to expand, it feels so good. And also the heat kills viruses, like they don't live, that's why we have the cold season. They, um, they what is it, they can't live past our uh, 98.7 human, um, what our body temperature is. So when it's cold, that's when they thrive better. And so you're getting that heat in and it helps like heal, you know, destroy. I just say destroy because it's not really, they're not really alive. There's just these like programs, genetic programs just out here floating and they like happen to get into you if your immune system's down, but it's not really alive. It's just something that we have around us all the time. We have parasites, we have onslaught of viruses, all, like bacteria, they're everywhere. But like the reason we're not getting it is because our immune system is high, you know, it's like, it's going good. 
um, but it's, they're there. And so it's like, there are ways to destroy them. Okay, so there's that. So there's thyme, oregano, and um, rosemary, very easy to grow. You can, like I said, you can eat them, put them in teas, That's do the vapor one. steam. And then you go to aloe. You can do anything else. Aloe, aloe, aloe super nutrient rich, like, like super nutrient rich. And then of course you helps you with like first aid, cuts, sunburns. And um, it's also like you take it in and it's immuno, what is it like called like immunomodulating that allows the immune system to fight back chronic viral and like bacterial infections and fungal infections. So it's like a really good superfood. So, and then that, like, I feel like these superfoods and these really potent like antiviral herbs is like the ones that are also really good to have in your garden. <laughs> so it's like, you can relate it to your house, but then if like, you're also a cannabis grower, like, hey, grow these in your garden because these are really good pesticides too. So yeah, so there's some really basic ones and yeah. <laughs> awesome. I love it, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah. And Rich, you're, you're, do, you're sorting some capsicums out over there, planting some chilies. What do you tell, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and uh, what you have going on out there. We're really excited. What are you, you thinking about through all of this? What do we need to be working on here? What's going on, Rich? <laughs> it seems like a lot of people woke up or, you know, have been alarmed to uh, doing what we thought was a really good idea about 40 years ago. Mushroom is funny. He says 30. I'm like, Mushroom, it's 40 years I met you. I was really young. I'm 62 now. And he's like, oh, no. 78, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. We've been doing it 30 years, guaranteed. You guys have been doing it longer than that. But it's all kind of the same. And so what it feels like right now is that, you know, it's contagious that people are actually feeling. It's so funny to look into a screen and all that. It's like, I see just, is that you, Shroom? Is that your room? I'm looking at his room, but I'm not seeing shroom. There are, uh, there you are. Oh, okay, peace, yeah. Um, but it's really interesting to, you know, to feel people so turned on to gardening and, you know, to really uh, spending time outside gardening more. A lot of people haven't been doing that, you know? And so for us, it's really refreshing in a lot of ways. It's like, wow. It actually happened that we actually think, you know, residential, the residential movement in gardening is taking hold. And that's super cool. Really cool to feel it in Boulder, to feel it everywhere. It's better you know, agriculture is kind of really, it's frontline stuff. And it makes me think about all of what is, what's going on? You know, there's a half a million Hispanic workers who control or who work our fresh vegetables and fruit systems. So there's a half a million people in California and around this country who pick all that food. And they're out there doing this and you know, they could, it could stop, you know? And well, then we'd have to get busy taking care of ourselves, you know, doing it in the garden. And when you get into the garden, you, get, you gotta get into diversity then. It's like, wow, all of a sudden just growing tomatoes isn't gonna do it. It's like, I gotta grow herbs, I gotta grow greens, I gotta select roots, I gotta pull a, pull a full diet. All of a sudden you start to think then, wow, we gotta grow grains and we gotta grow seeds that we can eat. Hi, Linda, hey. So all these, so I think for me, what's happened is, well, previous to when we got sort of the semi-lockdown, Colorado has a semi-lockdown. We're not so locked down, but there's a lot of wide open space and you can always get out. But I, I decided to do a diet, a little bit of a grain and small legumes diet and get into the, the contemplative head of chewing food for a while and not just taking sides of beef and chunking on burgers and thinking, oh, I can just do it with the paleo greens and burger thing or you know, and all this. And I found that actually after two weeks, my system really regulated and I started to vibe with like, you know, the farmers of the world again. And the people who actually sit and do the grazing while they garden for themselves, for their families. And so I, I it really kind of turned me back on to this whole thing of how eating is a craft. Like we craft our, our diet. And then, wow, then you start to connect. 
the garden, the big fields, the mountains, the creek sides, you know, you start to look at all of a sudden things with beating hearts, you don't necessarily want to knock off and eat maybe once in a while. But I live in a really different place. This is the front range in Colorado and it's very much like a paleo diet place. High dry plains, mountains, you know, it's like the original Marlboro man or something, but you know, it's, it's a rough and tough. But to like really integrate with this system, you got to latch on to stuff. Say, all right, the winds blow 80 miles an hour. The temperatures change between, you know, 80 degrees in the day and then it's 30 at night. All of a sudden you have to build in all this elasticity in your being to be able to live this way. And that is the garden. And that's like wildcrafting and working with seeds, working with fungi, working with all of us. We start to become so connected. That's what I'm seeing now, especially in your eyes. It's so lovely. This is wonderful to see you all because I don't spend that much time on a screen. Um, so I think that there's a lot of good things happening right now if we can just connect with the stuff that makes sense. And usually what makes sense right now to people is food and the earth and medicines. You know, I think about what Tamara's saying too, and. Um, you know, herbs in a busy farmer's life, in a busy day, in a busy when you're out there really grinding away doing stuff. When you get herbs in your hand and you scratch the earth and you start to cut the herbs and you smell and all the medicine starts, it's so real every time. And it's so wonderful. Hey, Shroom, what's up? I love it. <laughs> and you're wonderful, brother. <laughs> uh, I learned it all from doing, you know, and doing and brewing with people like you and, um, and like, it's just been, it's been a long time of like, okay, what do you go back to when you don't feel right? Well, you go grab some seeds and you start to look at what's in the seed collection. You go, wow, there's a whole story. There's my friends in that. Oh, that's eight generations. Whoa, when did that come? That was 1981. I saw that couple give a, a jar of seeds to my friend Gabriel and that was amaranth. Oh my goodness. That's 40 years ago. Golden amaranth. Unbelievable. You know, and then to see people like Mushroom come over to the garden and so we look at it together, we're like, whoa, we're really into this. And that, that's the stuff. To me, that's the real stuff. Is when, yeah. when humans are really connecting in a non-competitive way and we're really like, we're, it's like the mycelial thing came along to let us know that we have to stay grounded that way and to stay in, stay connected, earth-wise, mycelial-wise. We start to look at it, it's like, whoa, we're trees, we're shrubs. Oh, tall person, there's an acacia. Oh, there's a shrubby dude. Oh, that's the shroom. Oh, we're, we're all part of it. So anyway, that's the kind of stuff that I think about that keeps me sane in the middle of the insanity. Um, I'm working with capsicums right now. I'm in the middle of, I think I got seven just different bags. These are B cross C. These are a Bolivian rainbow cross cayenne. And what happened is the frutescence and the cayenne atoms cross. And what I got is a bunch of upright purple cayennes. And I was like, wow, this is really something. This is going to be real interesting, right? Oh, well, you just start a journey. Now I got seven seed lines, and each seed line's probably got at least 20 different accessions in it on its own that's just making up what it wants to do. So now I'm into 50 types, and you're like, what are you doing? I'm dealing with a chili. So, but anyway. <laughs> 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 It's like, and that's just one, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I want to hear from, uh, uh, and you started a Masa Seed Foundation. Is that right, Rich? Is that? Yeah, Masa. Well, Masa, Masa came out of, um, it came out of a lineage of uh, pea seeds and uh, earth star botanicals and seeds of change. And then I had Avondanza. I still have Avondanza. It's a family name. We really got into seeds and produce and like growing seeds and produce. So we were kind of original type with the CSAs and seed growing combinations. Um, I guess that was 1990. That's beautiful. And I know Dave, I just bring to bring you in on this. I mean, you, I've heard in Eugene and in Oregon down there, and I know you guys have been kind of, you've been working with 
the pea seeds too recently, or at least Penny has at the corner Throughout market. The years too. But seeds have been a, a hard thing to, to keep, uh, to, to even find in the area for food. And maybe you can introduce yourself and say what, what's uh, happening on the farm and tell us, you know, what you think now and what's happening with seeds. Well, uh, I'm Dave and this is Chelsea. We're with uh, Sweet Leaf Organic Farm and the plant. And we've been farming down here for a long time. And what we're seeing now is, um, I feel like, you know, when I talk to my friends in New York City or big cities where the, like, that's kind of the epicenter of this virus, that's like, um, you know, there's, the, the, it, it's very real out there. And here it kind of feels more of like a sort of pseudo apocalypse for lack of a better term. And, um, but what we are seeing is that for, for, for us as farmers, um, the, 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 the supply chain of seeds became really jammed up before even the whole lockdown and shelter in place happened. Uh, basically, it's not, it's not that the, the, there's not seed supplies from the growers, but more the, the packing houses and, and the people that are getting the seeds out to the people, that they're, they're overloaded. And just like every other business, less people are wanting to come to work out of fear. So their places are, are working on one cylinder and having to be doubled down on their production. So what we're seeing is a lot of like reputable, like the usual suspect seed companies, a lot of them have switched over to only, um, only taking orders for commercial growers. So home gardeners are, are jammed up and nursery people out here in Oregon or the nursery industry in Oregon is huge. It's, it's probably one of the top industries here. And most of it's like ornamental stuff and like your, your daisies or, you know, other flowers you see at Home Depot or Fred Meyer around the, around the country. But on top of that, most of those nurseries, a lot of their production is also food. You know, the, the six packs of conventional and organic starts at all the, all, all the, those same stores, the Fred Meyers, the Home Depots. And what they're seeing is all their ornamental and front lawn stuff is dead in the water and they can't even keep up on food production on that. That's like feeding the, the masses scale. So bringing that back to what we're doing is I think right now it's, it's really important to just take extra steps in food security and, and food safety to hopefully carry over long past this pandemic blows over. But I, I think that like, like, honestly, we, we were initially doing that just, just for this, the, the peace of mind of our customers. Like, I didn't really take this pandemic that seriously. And, and, but we saw that there was a bit of a fear factor. So we, we were taking extra steps in, in the point of sale and contact at our markets and, and our protocols here on the farm. But in the last weeks, it's gotten like very real and we're realizing that even though we're not an epicenter place that there's no there's no there, there, you're not going to lose anything by being overkill safe in 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 handling food for other people so that, that's kind of what that's been taking a lot of our time with extra compliance in that sense in place these days one thing um, oh. go ahead Chuck. Yeah, one thing uh, I've seen, which uh, I know um, at the corner market, pea seedlings are like right on the front right there and she can't keep them on the shelf. That's one of the first things uh, I guess people really have been buying and she's um, starting to carry a lot more starts too because there's a high demand. And um, just as a farm, um, we in the last like couple of weeks have gotten a lot of like calls from uh, well, we started a CSA last year, so we've been getting more calls about that and just people like actually what I've noticed to be the most amazing thing is that small neighborhood communities are reaching out together in order to like either become a hub so that we can drop off a few boxes in their neighborhood 
or I'm working with a few people who um, they, with their neighbors together, order enough food so that I can deliver to them. And so I really like the aspect of the neighborhoods coming together and really trying to um, focus on supporting the small and local farms and doing it collectively. I think that that's the really interesting thing, even though we're not supposed to stand near each other. But a lot of it is through, you know, e email and internet and everything like that. So that's been really helpful. Um, and that's been interesting because we haven't really put a lot of efforts out there on the on the web, but um, it's a really useful tool. But it's that whole mycelium thing. <laughs> yeah, so that's yeah. Been, that's been fun with um, around here. Mm -hmm. That's just beautiful. Um, I love it that, that you know people are are starting to transition and change. You know, we're awakening on a whole new level. There's so many you know positives that are coming out of this and it keeps coming back to now I think that you know people are talking about that victory garden and what people were were doing in in World War One and then I guess also in World War Two you know in, instead of the big sprawling uh, farms you know coming back to the small gardens and I really wanted to open up the conversation to all of you who are just like amazing farmers if we're gonna have small victory gardens you know like what kind of things do people want to put in it? You know, if there's a small area or what, what did you want to say? Yeah, Josh? I was also curious because one thing that's only really impressed me at, at your house, Mushroom, or going through your, your greenhouse and everything is just the kinship garden, you know, and the kinship garden idea. And when Rich is talking about biodiversity and we're all talking about biodiversity or Tamara, she's like, I want to get an aloe, you know, how many aloes are there? You know, you've, you've grown 200 tomatoes in your, in your, on your land before. And I always thought that was amazing. You know, we're, we're so limited in, in what we grow with broccolis and everything. And I'd love to hear, can you explain to us what a kinship garden is and how we can use it for biodiversity? It, it's a pretty interesting connection of, you know, it's like you, you have parents, right? And they have parents. And they had parents, and they had parents, and they had parents. And all of a sudden you start to realize, well, what happens if we put the parents together and then you start breeding new developments in children? More children, more learning, more experience, more opportunity, because you have included them as being intelligent, as being able as finding out that they really do love to eat vegetables and fruits and that there are all kinds of plums, peaches, apples, all these kinds. Of, and then we can start to put them and see how does it work when we have these in our yards, in our houses, in our greenhouses. I think it's a really very essential thing that you can not spend too much money and build a greenhouse and then you can control the temperature in some ways so you can experimentally look at what happens. So one of the things we like is Grexes. Now what's a Grex? G-R-E-X. Are you hearing us? Can we hear you? Yeah, yeah we're hearing yeah. you. We hear you. Yeah. 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 So, so th 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 this was a thing that happened way long in the beginning of the 20th century on orchids from Asia being sent to France and England. And those rare or orchid paphiopetalums, lady slippers, there was only one, two plants. And one of them in, the, in England died and the one in France got propagated. And then you start to say, oh, but actually if you let those relatives cross to one another, you start to get a new level of breeding and what will grow in trees, will grow this and, and or, that's what we're talking about is how do you improve the food system? What is the food system? What are the 20 amino acids that we all need? What are the vitamins that we don't get enough of? What are the metals and materials that are part of our agricultural cultivation, right? Which has zinc, which has uh, titanium, which all the different things that make the composition of our bodies are real things. They're just not sort of vague statements. They, I mean, it's just like we talked about the hemispheres of our brain. We got both of these. There's probably 150, 250 locales where you remember things in your right hemisphere and another 150 locales where you have it in your left hemisphere. And the two of them are 
sometimes getting along and sometimes not, right? Maybe we can learn more about existence. That's what we are doing. That's what the farmers are doing because anybody who ever wants to grow stuff and have it succeed and be good to eat and you can pass it on to people. And if they didn't feel so good, all of a sudden they start to eat stuff that as you were saying, supports the immune system, gives you an opportunity to think more clearly. And actually, what about just being able to do yoga in the level that you don't have to do anything? Can you sit and take a breath into your, into your chest cavity, into your, into your lungs? And can you sit there for minutes and more minutes and all of a sudden it's 10 minutes and, and then you can leave it. But all of a sudden you learn how to breathe because it gives you altered consciousness. It puts you in another level of reality. And then you go out to the garden so you can climb the trees, so you can do the, all the work that it takes to make beauty and diversity and good health and a chance that we do get rid of all the weapons and stop killing ourselves and our loved ones. What would be some of the plants that you think are the most important ones to build your immune system? You've, you've lived through a lot of can you know things that that you shouldn't be alive right now let's say and so what do you think are some of the most important things in your life that have kept you going and also mushroom like as far as the amino acids and like something that's going to keep us you know immune stimulating at, at, at all levels if we only have a small plot of land like so many people have like what's really important to put in there you and rich are doing a, a and, kale and you too rich or, or dave or tamara like you know what what are people looking for that's like whoa this is super nutrient dense for these reasons and 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 so what do you think well uh, uh, go ahead yeah you, you go ahead go ahead uh either or i mean we can jump back and forth nutrient density and superfoods was we used to kind of laugh when we first heard the term uh, because we were rediscovering ethnic foods that were all part of uh, you know, ethnobotany at one point, rooted into wild plant nature culture and then domesticated into plants with really high nutrient density because they came from a diverse population. And so it's like, all that stuff's kind of funny to us, other than that, if you grow, if you do grow more than one species of a, of a, a particular genus, then you start to get the different characteristics and learning about some of the nutritional density stuff because they really act different. And these are things that also came out of, you know, ethnic cultures. So then it drops you into ethnobotanicals and ethnobotany. Now all of a sudden you want to grow a botanical garden because bot botanical gardens are the study of medicinal plants. So we're all botanical gardeners. So like the shroom basically kind of was pioneering for us in his own, and all of it was being transformed through the cosmos as well as Mars is, uh, he was learning about Mars at the time, but uh, I never knew sometimes where that conversation was gonna start, whether it was gonna be Mars or under a tree somewhere. But anyway, uh, hey Mushroom, love you. Um, uh, but just the idea of diversity is what, that's what kind of gets you deeper into finding out little more pieces, you know, and, and you kind of don't find out till you do it. So that is where, of course we can't do it all. So then the more we can learn from each other and now actually information is being passed at such a beautiful level from, from so many of us now who are doing it, where before it was as well, but it was a little bit more difficult to go find out something. You had to go to the library, or you had to be lucky enough to run into somebody who was studying it enough to get you to go to the library. Again, thank you very much, Mushroom. But, um, but things like that, you know? And so right now, um, what were we talking about? We're talking about Santa Flor tomatoes. That oh, if you went cool. to yeah. the Peru, and you all of a sudden found that there's some species, species. Right. and Sympathy. all of a sudden you have hundreds of flowers and and tresses of right that the opportunity for diversifying and making it extraordinary. So, it, you know, it, it's it's. Uh, I love. Oh, but it's about the foods we're supposed to be gardening. So mainly, you know, good gardens were built a long time ago. So we and we're kind of all sitting here with a good 
there's a good availability of solid herbs. I mean, Tamara actually mentioned a couple of common herbs, but they do unbelievably great things for us. Actually putting your face into some mints is the best thing you can feel. When you get into, you rub your nose and face into some Greek oregano and see how you feel. It's unbelievable. It's like you, it transforms you. Go out and cut yarrow for an hour and you'll be mind blown. You're laying in the grass saying, I forgot everything was fucked up. It's like all these things start happening when we just inter interact with nature and plants and get closer, you know? What's and we the get... genus of oregano that oregano oil comes from? The genus of the oregano is organo, but I mean, it's, uh, it's vulgare. Vulgare is the one that's the strongest, the Greek oregano. The Italian oreganos are, um, what are they? They're different species and they're a little bit less hardy. So the Greek oreganos are the ones that are really hardy. Uh, maybe Tamara knows or Shroom knows, I forgot. One of them is... You know, I was thinking too that all of the herbs Herb. that Tamara was mentioning too is that, um, you know, they're great antibacterial, antifungal, more like antipathogen, but they really leave our beneficials alone. And I've been really going down, you know, the long roads of, of our immune stimulus response and how related it is to our microbiome and then our microbiome and how it's totally related to the soil and what we're missing in our lower microbiome is everything that the soil already has so you know like getting in the dirt and 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 being a part of that so you know it can start with all of these herbs and it always goes back into my brain about the microbiome and not using sugar i mean sugar is a big part of our diet that's probably you know a really major destroy destroyer of our microbiome and then you know there's a lot of people using sugar in their garden nutrients too and i think there's you know probably reasons why we shouldn't and uh Sure. Mushroom, I mean, you you taught us about the yakone. You were the first person to t teach us about the yakone. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and Dave, you've been- And, and Dave, Chelsea you and Chelsea are growing, are growing like a bunch crazy. of yakone. But I mean, the yakone is a really good substitute to anything sugary. And is there anything you can tell us about yeah. the yakone? and the micro- Well, there are, you know, it's like there are what 15 or 20 different yakones and it's pretty hard to get germplasm uh, from Peru and from Bolivia and stuff for a lot of these varieties. It took it, it took us 30 years to get Oka, Mashua, Yakon, Oyuku, Aracacha, Maca, all the different Andean root crop, crops that was for tens of thousands of years were, were stable, had a society that fed them from roots, right? And what, what so now we are, and, and then you find out that, oh, well, actually, you have glucosyl fructose, uh, glucose, okay, sugar, glucosyl fructose, disaccharide. So as you start to increase the number of sugars on the thing, you have another kind of food that's good for your health and your medicine. That's not just because it was sweet. It was because the polymers, when they were digested, did certain things that we didn't even know what they are, right? We're just beginning to, un to sort of insight. What is the structure of biodiversity, nutritional biodiversity. What is it we really need? And you see the same thing. Maybe something you need is to take a walk every day for a couple of miles, right? Rather than what you eat, it's what you do with the food you got that you can actually go and look at the sky and look at the clouds and look at the birds and learn how to talk to the birds or and you talk about microbes and stuff. There's so many, I mean, with that thing, that was a good uh, thing about, but, uh, uh, let's see, salvia, genus salvia in the mints. So how many salvias are there? There are 800 species of salvias, right? The, what do we see? We see the drop in the bucket as usual about a lot of this stuff. And the same with the, the oregonums or, or you know, the mints as a, as, a, as a huge cop. That's why some of it's nice to lay out maps to see what the structure of who's related to who and how old they are and where they came from. And, and then what happened is, as life and history took all, all of us. That I mean, that's what we're looking at with the viruses and stuff. Uh, I had polio when I was a kid that, that was uh, seven years old. So I was in the hospital for well, a couple of months and couldn't stand up. 
right? Uh, and then I, and I had a cancer, right? And a, a Robert Nagorny uh, knew how to take something out of a t tissue and say, oh, let's figure out how to cure this cancer and figured out how to cure cancer because he understood enough about how the molecules actually work, how the DNA and the RNA and the proteins and how they interact and how you build these things and how you take them apart and how you restructure the stuff. This is the same as what we do when we grow food and we have new possibilities of mixing. Oh, we like that. Let's take, try 10 of those and just let them interbreed. And then let's see what happens next and what happens next. And all of a sudden you start to have other nutritional characteristics that we don't even know about because we don't allow experimental science to really explore, well, cysteine or methionine. Every protein we got starts with methionine on the beginning of the protein sequence, right? Well, methionine, that's a, that's a sulfur-containing amino acid. All the stuff about it is worth knowing about, just like you do, about how valuable all these different characteristics are. So, oh, I, I, I'm so grateful. The colors. What? Yeah, please. And bringing in the colors, you know, the double red corns instead of just, or, you know, a yellow sweet corn or... Uh, you know, the, the fire on the mountain corn and all the different kinds of corns. There's so many different kinds of corn you can make, you know. And yeah, and we've gotten some of the most colorful seeds, you know, from you, Mushroom. And then we've gone, you know, 15 years and growing them up here more north from you. And and you were the one that really opened up our eyes to the importance of colors and, and, and that also being a part of the holistic nutrition that we need. And the diversity and, and, you know, realizing we need to rely, we need to rely on, like we said, biodiversity of nutrients. And unless you mix up the stuff, you don't even know what it is. But if you give it a chance to, to, to learn from itself, you find new things that you didn't know exist. We had that happen with the tomatoes. We never thought we'd get tomatoes that have 100, 200 flowers on a spike. The same thing with peas. All of a sudden you have these peas with, you know, beautiful totally different characteristic and they're six, eight, 10 feet tall, right? There's, now, wow, this is stuff is available. Who knew any of the, you know, how can a bunch of hippies figure out stuff that all these academics and all these universities, have, they don't do it. It was just a bunch of people who could get together and work together and say, let's make beauty, let's make love, let's make good health. And that's what you're doing. So thank you, thank you. I think you just, turned out to be an academic and a good hippie. Yeah, I, th I think you had both of them going on, Mushroom. <laughs> well, I had, I had a good thing happen when I was, what, 13 years old or something like that in Erasmus Hall High School. I, I This guy, I, I brought him, I said, I want this guy to come, would you come home and meet my mother? So I brought this guy over to meet my mother. And then his name was Bobby Fisher. <laughs> and I went, <laughs> that's who he was and and uh i was in the i was i was in another year i became the president of the chess club and the only one i couldn't beat was bobby fisher <laughs> <laughs> i guess in that case you can let that one go <laughs> yeah i think you can probably let that one go <laughs> i love that story and <laughs> <laughs> Dave, um, you've been doing a lot of stuff. You, you guys have been growing, you know, uh, as much volume as you can and are really, you know, as, as nutrient dense and, and as much area as you can. If you had to lay out some veggies that people could grow that would be super easy, that would bring like high yield and and you know sort of help people out through these times and and give them like some food quickly you know what do you guys think like you know what, what what's up over there <laughs> the you know our eyes have a zeaxanthin lutein and beta carotene so those help our eyes to see as we get older well lutein zeaxanthin if you grow white corn you don't get any of the stuff that your eyes need for nutrition. So that's why you, you do grow and eat yellow corn. And then when you all of a sudden find out you can have high anthocyanin sweet corn, which means that it stimulates the immune system all over the body, right? Dark purple corns, red purple corns. So some of this stuff is we're just beginning to find out there's a very important sequence of stuff that goes with the food system. 
And so if we work hard and we have good collaboration and we have great uh, people who care about it and care about being alive and raising families that are healthy and, and able to be, uh, to realize the planet is an amazing place. We're in the process of destroying a planet. We've got a lot of work to do. That's why this is kind of like the great awakening. I feel like, you know, it's like, it's like, it's the year of the root cellar, you know, it's the year of saving seeds. You know, I feel like, you know, we, we all need to look at our garden as a, as a seed producer, you know, and, and not just a, a, a place to get fruit from it or, or even roots or whatnot. But um, are you, are you, uh, Dave, are you guys doing more seeding on your property now this year? Are you guys going to take, I know you guys have made, some lettuce seeds and the different things over there. Maybe tell us some of the seeds you've made over there. And what's in your boxes for your CSA right now? Well, we're 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 not. Uh, I'd say we're amateurs on the seed production side. We have, you know, obviously we save our own garlic, and we have different. We save the cone seed and beetle is a seed we save, and a lot of our open pollinated like kales and things like that. But um. Basically, what, what what we're seeing right now is that is you know I, I think I think people are, are at this at this crossroads where we can either turn into like I, it's a cheesy cliche but when you see advanced civilizations of like you know aliens or alien sighting they have these giant heads and these giant eyeballs and these little flaccid bodies like all they've done once they became advanced in their brain, they're not physical anymore. And they just sit in front of a computer and everything is brought to them. Like everything's mail order by Amazon and other galaxies or whatever. So in this pandemic time, there's this, everyone's all scared. So we're, we've shifted a lot of our, like to answer your question and be a little long-winded, we, we, we've shifted um, a lot of our stuff to, you know, Penny's doing a lot of online ordering and, and gathering from all the other farms in town. So you can one-stop shop at the corner market and get your meat, eggs, cheeses, and produce from all, everything grown in the valley right now, one-stop shopping. And which is cool for now, but I think we're not trying to participate once this mayhem blows over into that's the new norm. More just hoping it's an opportunity to like so that being said i think it's, it's a real like responsibility and opportunity for us to uh to really promote what it is that we're doing and educate other people to like how to how to grow your own garden and i think one thing I heard Mushroom say at a at a some random speak years ago was, you don't plant your garden, you, you plant, 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 plant your garden. So I think that probably most people tune into this podcast and, and that have, have been devoting their lives to being out there in their gardens. We have a lot of knowledge between us and people are like eager right now. And 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 they're really like either like I think it's like it's a combination of either you're living from a pace of fear or or excited for change. Either one, like it's 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 our time to just like wear on our chest what it is what we do and and like, like free up any information that we all have and share it. So I went on a little bit of rant from now. I don't remember the original question, but what's in our CSA boxes right now is nothing. We, we, our CSA doesn't start up till June. We're just Mostly just restructuring our our uh, our, our ha, ha, how we're distributing right now. We're, we're basically doing a combination of online sales and and just more extra safety measures at the farmers markets. And but but the CSAs are, are like popping right now. We're 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 basically trying to um, in, in our survival and and momentum, we're trying to like get everybody's money to join up our CSA before before uh, things go back to normal and they go back to the supermarket. <laughs> That's kind of how we're around. 
That's awesome. And Tamara, you've always had um, a beautiful way with, you've had a, a, you know, a cannabis company in California, but you've always had a lot of beautiful other products that went along with it. And that's what I think Heal Thyself is about. And, and I'm wondering um, what this, what does this year look like for you? Are you going to, are you going to be able to plant the ganja in the same way? Um, are, are you going to, what kind of interplanting will you do that's maybe different than last year? And a lot of people out there, you know, we do have this, this beautiful conduit of, of cannabis people and that are watching now. So they're all trying to figure out what am I going to be growing what underneath my cannabis? What plants are you cannabis? growing with your cannabis? What can I grow under my cannabis? What can work? And I know, girl, you've got it going on. And Dave and Chelsea. And Rich, we too. saw your gardens from last year. And so let's talk about that too. Like how can we incorporate all these different medicinals? Tamara. All right, so yeah. Um, where we are is this year is all about like rebuilding our foundations. Right now I'm still tearing things apart and because I'm putting in more space because I'm seeing the need for more herbs because even the medicines I've been making the last few years, now they're, they're sold out. And I already had this feeling last year. I was like, I was, I'm ready to go full force with some different medicinals. I'm seeing the need, like I can never grow enough. And um, I'm definitely been encouraging other farmers I know to please like grow some medicinals. Like there's some like ones that are very nutrient rich that are also a good cash crop. Like you have ashwagandha root, there, that is a really, that's a superfood right there. That it helps you build chi. It like helps you have endurance. It helps your immune system build. Like I feel like we all should have that one in our garden. And it's a good cash crop, like I said. And um, goji berries, goji berries are another because goji berries are complete protein. And um, they also influence like the, all the hormones in the body, which also improves uh, it's like our immune system. And it helps like, our human growth hormone is one of the one plants that can actually give us longevity. And it can, it grows in the high mountains of Tibet all the way to the desert. So it's a really great adaptogen and it's beautiful and it, it's very abundant if you get the right variety. And, uh, and you can also use the leaf of it as well. And so it's a great plant to have around. And um, then there's like, the ones that we grow that are beneficial to us and the plants. Like one of my favorites is nettles. Nettles are, I find them so beneficial, of course, to ourselves. Like there's, they have vitamin A, C, E, they're rich in protein, calcium, iron, um, magnesium, manganese, phosphorus, selenium, zinc. Like they're such a powerful superfood for us. And they're a powerful superfood for our plants. So I actually get a whole like 55 gallon barrel every spring, make sure I, and make a fermented tea with that. And that's, I feed that like all year in small doses to the plants, just like I give myself that tea almost every day. Um, but that's also really good to grow beside your cannabis. Um, I believe it was Dia from Nomad's Landing who told me this trick. Like if you grow your nettles close to your cannabis, your trichomes, um, the defense system that the cannabis has is the trichomes. And so they actually produce more. It's like stronger. Well, I grew side by side, two plants, and it was visibly different. And I've done that a couple of times. And it's like a visibly different, more trichomes. It's just beautiful. I'm like, whoa, this is wow. And um, they can get out of hand. So they're really good to have because then you have nettle root which is a really good male hormone balance scene and also very grounding and great for women as well. But it's just like, it's another, it's like this nettles are a superfood. The whole plant can be used for us, our plants. Like I totally like nettles. Yes. <laughs> um, and holy basil, holy basil, Tulsa, you know, it's, it's amazing for us. It helps us reduce stress. It kind of brings joy. It uplifts our spirit. It's like it's calcium, zinc, iron, and then also for our plants, it like feeds our plants as well. There's so many nutrients in both that. So it's like a beneficial for both. And then there's yarrow and chamomile that you can grow underneath. And those help bring those terpenes out as well. Plus provide teas and medicine for us. Um, I think those are, let's see, what else does I grow? It's Hilarious. I, uh, I, yeah. 
Um, yeah, just the ones that I grow underneath the plants. Those are like my big ones. It's like the nettle, the tulsa, the yarrow, the chamomile, and then food, like food all throughout. You know, you got to have different varieties to help like feed our cells. Our cells get healthy. We build really better bodies. Our immune system is really good. And then, of course, you just feed all that back, all that material kind of back into your soil. But um, yeah, I mean, if you have optimal, optimal like soil and like these plants are grown in, then they have like the medicines and the nutrients that they have for you. And then you take that in and then you're like at this optimal level. And it's just like, again, back to that vibration, you're having a high vibration again and you're interacting with those plants. And so I think it's, it adds a superfood. Another one, dandelion. Love dandelion, every freaking bit of it. It helps you cleanse liver, your kidneys. It's a great, um, it's a great tonic. It's a great bitter because we have so much sweet in our diet. A lot of times it helps balance that out. And, uh, and then of course the root dandelion root is, it's just got so many benefits. It's a superfood and that's just like, it make tinctures with it do everything you can it's great stuff i love it because all the herbs that you're mentioning too you know so many of them have flowers whether we're going to be using the roots or whatever and we're dealing more and more like in the same way that our body is dealing with pathogens the plants are dealing with pathogens we're losing valuable nutrients in our soils i don't even know how many thousands and thousands of tons of soil just are being blown away because there's no microbiology to hold it with this you know big ag sort of mentality and we are really needing more and more predators to come into our gardens. So, you know, cannabis is seeing a tremendous amount of pathogens on it. And I know, you know, my gardens here, we, we didn't even have any big ag around us and we're seeing more pest pressure than ever. And every time we bring in more flowering plants, more pollinator more gardens, trees that flower, more trees more that flower. Yeah, think That's about right. like the narthenas now are blooming. Like what can we do to I and I, and I can't and separate what can we do for our body defend and what can we do for the gardens it's the same thing and i just love that so you were just like mentioning all those great pollinators rich what were you growing with your cannabis last year oh it was a really good year i mean cannabis has so many different um uses you know as a as a carbon crop as well as a medicinal all the way down to a medicinal plant obviously for humans and stuff and then it's its compatibility. We did like give a little bit of distance from it in the fields, and I actually used it like a hedge plant. It is beautiful hedge plant, and we we use it for like isolation corridors for seed crops. So we sort of created a wave where we'd have rows of it, and then we'd work down into like a group of say capsicums and some basil's and things we didn't want to cut uh, to cross necessarily with some others and put a whole bunch of other stuff in them and kind of kept the rows. In this case, it was a row garden. Um, those, those were probably about 50 feet apart. So those rows, so it really created a beautiful atmosphere and had a lot of windbreak activity and stuff. And then where we actually did have it in close to some other crops, like there was a sorghum in there, a group of sorghums we were using. Wow, did they grow compatibly together? You know, um, it's so interesting, Tamara said that about the nettles and the, and the cannabis, because that's what Vavilov found, like when, when Vavilov discovered um, cannabis, he discovered it was growing kind of on the edges of creeks ditch, but out in the sunnier area where the, where the nettles and the, uh, and the thistles were growing, the big tall thistles, like milk thistles and such. And I thought, wow, what a medicinal combination, you know, in the wild. So when it comes to cannabis, one of the things that comes to me is like, it's such a valuable plant that you could use it as sort of a specimen plant and create a garden around it just because it's so holy in its own right. And yet at the same time, you can use it in hedges, you can use it in wild garden plantings. So you got so many options that you can just do whatever you want with it. I mean, one thing for people to, to understand when they start hearing herbal names, I wanted to just add, because Tamara, you're so full of really good information um, and really good, I could tell, knowledge too, which I respect, um, is that 
uh, people need to, you know, kind of check into plant cycles and understand what perennials really are and what what's a perennial, what's an annual, what's cannabis, how does it grow in the season? What are you going to get to this year when you plant a cannabis plant? Are you going to put it in with a perennial? Well, then you better have some plants. Or if you're going to, are you going to put it in with annuals? So it's like there's a, you know, there's a whole learning in there kind of looking at it as if she's the, if she's sort of the centerpiece, everything works around it. So there's a way to look at that in gardening, you know, and look at the species, look at the, whether it's hot, you know, what are you going to really put as a companion? And um, there's a lot of ways to go, but we did use it in field crops and I love it as a carbon crop. I really, really do love it. I want it out there in big fields. In fact, this year I want it all over the fields in a complete mosaic of corn, beans, and squash. I'm gonna spread out a whole five acres of a whole summer garden where it's all polyculture and the corn bushes are six and eight, and nine feet apart. When then there's vines blowing all on, growing all underneath them and stuff growing up them. And we want cannabis out in the middle of it and sunflowers and sorghums and all the summer garden create sort of this big polycultured annual garden. And so you go. feel magic, feel like you can grow, you know, you grow in history, you grow in fresh. There's so many things to learn. Um, we did some of it last year. It was phenomenal. I'm looking so forward to doing it again this year. So people looking at like nutritional yields per acre in terms of a lot like what Vandana talks about, like diversity in an acre is a nutritional yield. And so all of a sudden you got an acre of, a, of a, a three sisters with all that volume, with all the other diversity under it. And now you've got multi-nutrition and all kinds of benefits off an acre. You can't even regulate or you can't measure the, how, how high that yield is. It's so amazing. So, and then if there's seed crops involved with it, well, then you got isolations. And all of a sudden you got a garden, you got 50 things you're going to collect seeds off of. You're going to feed at least 50 people off an acre. And this is going to be a new kind of CSA. And then people can start to see how they can build gardens on acreage when they go out and they leave the city and they want to go to the country and grow an acre, a half acre. So I'm really interested in garden designs. I love it. And much for South Africa that had CBG in it. And do, do you remember the name of that one? And, and um, I like the idea that, you know, we were, we had a discussion with you different cannabis. And it, and it came up that one, was it the helianthus? Seed? I'm going to go get the name of it. <laughs> <sighs> what else? So also, I guess I'll just say what we're doing on our property right now which i'm i'm feeling really stoked um the sea buckthorn um is going off out on our property right now so we have like a super thorny crazy sea buckthorn going and um we've been growing uh, a, a ginger let me know mushroom when you get that uh name and i'll, I'll stop talking uh, oh it's okay it's it's helichrysum and broccolidrum yeah the helichrysum helichrysum so right with CBD. So, you have seeds of that? And you were talking about Spring Hill Seeds, oh, was it? Can you tell us about that seed company? Silver Hill Seeds. Silver Hill. Silver tell Hill. Silver Hill Seeds for a minute. A Silver Hill Seeds, originally founded by Rod and Rachel Saunders. Uh, so we were, it's an amazing seed collection they have thousands and thousands of interesting kinds of seeds, most of which we've never seen or had much experience with at all. So when, I, when they said to me, so I got clivias, I like clivias. It turns out my father used to grow clivias in his office as a physician. So not just the same one, always with the orange flowers. And then all of a sudden I was reading in, in, in Silver Hill Seeds and they say, well, there's about seven species and if you cross this one with that one, with this one, with that one, and that one with this one, you end up with some new flowers, new plants, new characteristics. So I grew a hundred of them. And so the same kind of thing has to do with Helichrysum umbraculigerum. They say, wow, you know, there's 500 species of Helichrysum, but only one of them has CBD. That was interesting. So I asked them to send me some seeds. So I have a few seeds I planted some they're not coming up well. They didn't come up well last year. So that's 
part of the issues, of course. <laughs> yeah. That'll happen when you're getting seeds from different parts of the world and, and everything. You know, so what one of the things um, is people don't realize in Oregon and even in California is you can grow um, ginger and um, curcumin and, and um, uh, turmeric, different colors of turmeric. There's like five different colors, at least five different colors of turmeric that I'm used to seeing like in Bali that people use for medicine. Um, and then, and another thing that I think people don't realize is that the use of water plants in their garden. And that was another thing that I thought that was interesting at your garden. You, you used a lot of different um, insect eating plants that grow in water. So you could have different water ponds around your garden, right? And those garden uh, ponds could, could have, you know, uh, let's say carnivorous plants in them. Well, Wapato too. I mean, the thing of, you know, here's a food plant that was a major staple food plant of the native peoples. And it was like, it was unknown pretty much. And yet you find out that if you can't come across from the gorge, from the, the river, from, from British Columbia to, to uh, Washington, there's a place where the, everything you see is a Wapato there's tens of thousands of these plants, which are the food plants all over the mud flats coming over from, the, from, the, uh, from, uh, from BC to Washington. And you know, it's like, you have to be willing to slide down a mud slide to get into the place where all the plants are. But all of a sudden you realize, put a couple in your pocket and then put them in a tub in your place and start to grow more food of a totally different kind that was grown by the Native Americans for thousands of years before we ever showed up. I like that, and the canvas is another one that's from the Willamette Valley that people use. I mean, it's not just in the Willamette so Valley. So can we can we bring Come that? Um, yeah. Can we bring that CBD rich flower? Like I, I heard that that's they're finding most of the CBG in that uh, flower. Can we start co mixing like different medicines to bring up our cannabinoid ratios of CBD and blending with cannabis? What do you think about that, that mushroom? How, how do, can, can that happen? Could be. See, uh, you have to put them together and uh, shake them up, you know, and uh, <laughs> grow them for a couple of years and uh, see if it comes out the way you like it. <laughs> rich, rich, no, rich, no. We, ha we have this kind of, well, if you can do this, you could actually turn. They take the world and change it, you know. Okay, let's do that too. <laughs> One thing that we're really resonating with on the farm here is uh, building these, you know, just amazing beds, you know, with the with them and the aquaculture beds and these big swales and these big mounds and just putting a crazy amount of material together and mounding dirt on top of it and growing everything out of it. Now I'm starting to see just dips in the land and pockets in the land where I can just really toss a lot of material in there. I mean, we've been cutting a lot of stuff off the trees and I'm, I'm right now in the springtime, um, we've, we're doing a lot of bare root planting because right now the snow is still melting at our house. So we uh, probably two thirds of our property is now bare. So that's really good. But some of our greenhouses are still filled with snow. So we're taking this time to do a lot of uh, you know, environment stuff, but, you know, building these beds is really amazing. And then it, it creates this soil that is so alive. And we've been really, you know, tripping out on, on like endophytic fungi and how the root tips, you know, how they excrete the, these enzymes and how they uptake these soil organisms and they put it into their plant blood and the endophytic fungi and bacteria goes into the plant blood of the plant and creates health and well-being in the plant and creates the nutritional um, capability that the plant has. And so it, I feel like it puts words to the soils and everything that we're, and I, that and we're I, doing. Yeah, it's rad too, because here we go, back to the microbiome, you know, like what's the most important thing that we can be doing for ourselves to make better decisions about our garden and what we're gonna be putting in it. It's just like back to the soil, back to our microbiome, throw a shit ton of poly, beneficial polyculture at it, 
<laughs> beneficial microbiology at it. Mob gardeners. <laughs> We're bound to find something healthy out of it. You know, so much sickness on the planet right now. I really believe this is it. It's in the soil. The answers are in the soil. There's also a lot of answers in the soil. I mean, it's really much more complicated when you when you look at how much diverse microbes there are and how what kind there's archaea first, not only bacteria, but there's archaea. The archaea, well, that's billions of years ago. The archaea gave rise to back. So that some of this stuff has been much more complicated as to what soil really is and what we're growing in it and what it does for it. It's very hard to figure out just by looking at it from a distance. You're going to have to be able to have some analytical microbiology to know what is the stuff that's actually going on when you change this thing, when you alter this thing. And then some of these plants you talk about, which are such important herbs and stuff, what happens when you add new things that you never had available before? How do they do? How do we feel? Are we going to live for 150 years rather than only two weeks? Right. Yeah, it's our big goal to live longer than, you know, not very, very long. Well, so. and feeling good while we're living. That's the thing, you know, I want to yeah. live you, for you as feel long good. as I can feel good. Well, you feel good, yes, because you do good stuff. And a lot of it takes a lot of work to do good work. Okay, but that is inspiring, right? That, that's, that's, that's like the gift. Well, you know, they like the idea of sharing seeds and sharing plants back and forth, you know, and, and, you know, we've been doing it with, with cannabis, we've been doing it with, with food. And I just like the idea that, um, you know, we're just saying, Hey, you know, is there, how many kinds of kale are there? You know, let's, let's, let's try and get a bunch of different kale. Let's just, let's just, you know, get as much as we can. And, and then, looking into the berries you know you have many different I, a mulberry tree is a tree i don't have on the property right now i would like to, i would like to have more mulberries um and talk about yields and 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 density and like whoa like uptaking minerals from down deep and below yay for the mulberry and i think it's really awesome for the first time you know cannabis people we've been looking at all these different strains hundreds of different strains and now a bunch of us are awakening to the fact of like whoa there's like 150 different carrots too like that's yeah. equally as cool no. you know we were just <laughs> on a um you know on the big island and we were looking at a mango farm um jeremy big love and um he, they were saying there was like 60 different kind or 80 different kinds of yeah. mango trees on the property and i was like wow that's probably more than they have you know there's and then looked it up and i was like oh wow there's 600 types of mango <laughs> trees so and they can bloom at different times of the year that's good yeah, yeah. so that's there's fun. more than just an og <laughs> i i think i sent some kale seeds to rich yeah i got them i'm very excited about them yeah yeah good okay so that's yeah, the, the there, there look to be an interspecies cross in there too. They look like that you had a two, it wasn't just Oleraceae, you had some kind of a, 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 a Juncia cross or something in there. I didn't, I'll have to grow it to see what it exactly is. We got, that, there's, there's six or eight different kinds of, of kales in the backyard for, for the same reason. If we can put it, and I love to watch them interbreed, drop the seed. That's an interesting thing about planting seeds. I like to go, go to the seed room and take a handful of uh, lettuce seeds and walk out into the garden and just scatter the lettuce seeds in various places. The same thing with almost everything. Rather than being compulsively organized as if I'm gonna make it in rows, I like to just reach into the pocket and say, wow, look at this. You're talking about good uh, uh, daisies. Huh? Okay, let's put a bunch there and a bunch there and a bunch there. Anyway. <laughs> I'm liking that too. I'm I'm feeling that a little bit more on our property. I, um, I I don't know if it's as productive for like the market gardens and all that, but I think it's really good. Not for the this is not productive. This is inspiring, so you can actually get more done with less work. <laughs> and that's really what matters. I mean, you have what kind of trees do you have in your backyard? Juju bees. Um, what 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 are some of the trees you have in your backyard that are really unique and different 
mushrooms. Well, just ha having sequoia dendron gigantea that's that's planted in 1954 and is now you know uh, 150 feet tall or whatever it is these huge trees it makes it feel good every morning every time you get up and you walk and you look at these trees and on the very top of the tree those tvs tvs uh uh what uh, uh turkey vultures right the tur tur turkey vultures land when they come back into this area they land on the top of the giant redwood trees and there's sometimes six eight or ten of them right and so so what that's an incredible tree to have in the yard all of a sudden you realize what a it, it's inspiring then there's a maple tree that maple tree is probably 150 years old in the in the yard it's a huge maple tree right i mean what trees do we actually have? We also had a bunch of plums that came from from uh, California, and most of those trees died, but they recrossed with one another, and all of a sudden we have new plum trees that we'd have. You know, you make up a name, but that's something different. When you eat the fruit, you realize, huh? I never ate this one before. It's not in any books. Oh, good. It's like tulips. Delana and Mara, Delana especially planted a lot of tulips. There's hundreds of tulips in flower. You walk around and there's this and this and that and this and that's different from this. Wow, this is really interesting, right? All of a sudden you start to have, everywhere you look, you see the development of more diversity. And that's what you get when you just grow everything together. And that's what I think we're loving about the polyculture more than anything is just seeing yeah. everything just kind of create an environment around itself and change the the soil makeup and everything underneath it and you know i i really i really love that um dave and you've been you've been out like in the public selling you know at markets and things for a long time with sweet leaf dave and i'm sure you're seeing that are, are more people interested in different types of food, fruits and vegetables that they haven't been before are people looking for different things like you've been doing it a long time what's the like transitional flow of veggies and fruits. Oh, you're muted. Or Chelsea. Chelsea's there too. You're muted. Can, can you guys hear us? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, honestly, um, there, there, there's not a whole lot of people seeking new things out. I think that our, our job as farmers we, we educate people what is in season and what's popping off and what they, what, what like, it's almost like back to the, uh, the, you know, the Home Depot, Walmart, Fred Meyer, like uh, comparison, like what people are consuming, they're, they're like, they're kind of like sheep. I hate to say it, but like the end cap of the aisle or like what, what while you're waiting in line, like what you see, um, what, what's, what's in front of your face, that that's what people generally buy. And I think to, to bring that back to like a more holistic approach, I think it, it's our job, like whatever we have the most of and whatever is like the most abundant and like, oh man, I hope I can sell this, these zillion boxes of whatever today. <laughs> um, it's because that's what is in season. That's what mother earth is saying, eat this because this is what I'm kicking out for you right now. And I think it's our job to be like, when people are like, what do I want? You want this, because this is what we got the most of. And we have the most of this is because this is what the season is rolling in on. So to answer your question in that respect, people generally, I mean, I, I think what we're seeing right now in this pandemic time is like the markets generally, like, like for example, last Saturday, we were at the Portland Hollywood market. And it was a beautiful, like warm, blue sky, sunny day, the first mark of the year. That should be like, like mob deep of, of, uh, of customers. But there's, the, the, it, was, it was almost like a ghost town. And only like the diehard of the diehard were coming to get their vegetables. And they had their masks on and they, everyone was staying way more than six feet apart and in and out. But the people that were coming we're buying like 10 times the amount that they normally buy. Like they were just stocking up and getting in and out. So to answer your question, it's like 
right now people aren't like looking for anything in particular other than fresh nutrients and what well, to tie that in what i was originally saying is like right now like the overwinter in, in in our zone here in the Willamette valley the overwinter leafy greens are just starting to like fade off and they're all going to flower so we're and and then and then our, our early spring plantings that are like late winter plantings are like there's that gap and we always try to tie in that gap with um with like picking off the leaves that are still hardier but more nutrient dense and just carry that over until the fresh like you know more tender stuff is, is rolling and generally we see a, a few week window to close the deal uh, between the overwinter stuff and the fresh stuff but um with with how much people are just kind of like geeking for like anything fresh nutrients to, to put in their body we're, we're, we're picking the flowering stuff that much harder before the 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 you know the the january february field plantings are coming in so um but to, to, to try to answer your question again people aren't even trying to like i i want this and i want that they just want anything fresh and good right now you know our joke even in um even, not in pandemic times, but like once the markets start up, you can practically bunch spring, like you can practically bunch grass and people will buy it this time of year. You know? not, but, but, but that's that, like anything fresh and good is, is game on, you know? Game on. So I, I had something I wanted to say, seeing as I've been so quiet and I enjoy listening to everyone talk and it's definitely not my wheelhouse, but I kind of wanted to talk about maybe what you guys thought of the importance of that mic macrobiotic eating. When I had uh, a raw food cafe in Vancouver back in 2003, uh, everything was organic and vegan and raw and it was macrobiotic. It was all grown about like a hundred miles from this from the from the cafe i wouldn't like fly coconuts uh on a jet airplane from hawaii and be like check out my coconut oil at my raw food cafe so like what do you guys think obviously as farmers and stuff it's got to be like is this a good opportunity to start sort of turning people on to why macrobiotic dieting is is kind of a, a positive and why maybe you know flying your bro uh, broccoli or your strawberries in from you know some yeah south america or whatever in the winter because they don't grow where you live maybe 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 we don't need to do that absolutely i i always think of it as um like if you're eating a banana and you're up in the northwest you're telling your body when you ingest the banana that you are somewhere warm where bananas grow so i think that eating what's in season and even if we're pushing the season and growing other things that wouldn't you wouldn't normally find in our native landscape you're still um you're still encouraging that you're telling your body internally where it's at and what it's feasting on and i think that's a really great coordination coordinates for immunity and just dealing with like our environment that on that same note and and, and the theme what you're saying i think that right now I, may, I could maybe do this a little less sloppily than my first attempt but um like the fear factor of everybody being held up in their cubicles or their homes in these big cities. And, um, and, and when they run out to the, the grocery store, like the international supply chain is sketchy at best in, 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 uh, in trying times like this. So I think that that being said, um, I think this is a real opportunity for all the gardeners and farmers out there to really I think we're all too busy out in the field gardening and farming and, and like there's not enough hours in the day to get your stuff done. But I think this is an opportunity right now to really kind of give a little, like spend like, even if it's five minutes a day, like with an Instagram blurb or a Facebook, whatever. I mean, they like take the social media for what it's worth and to uh, really promote what it is that we do people be like yo you can buy stuff right here right now or you can plant your own stuff in your own backyard so i think that in the paradigm shift of like here and now it's a real opportunity to like buy local like 
don't don't rely on stuff from the other side of the world and instead like vote with your dollar here and now with your local guy <coughs> it's even better do it yourself in your own backyard and 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 pick the brain of the local guy to figure out how to do that I suspect it would be interesting for people to learn the relationship of understanding the foods that grow during the different seasons in the area that they live. That could be really educational for, for, for people. Yep, there's no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. What we have grown out in the back, kales and salad plants and they grow and Rich, you're, you're talking about bioregional seeds and, and climatizing seeds and having seeds that are good for your area. I mean, do you how, how long do you feel like it takes to sort of climatize a seed to your zone? Do you feel like after one year, you kind of have a, a different genetic imprint on that? Yeah, or Colorado is your... tough, right? Like how long does it take to become biologically intelligent there? Yeah, well, it's hard to, it's to become biologically intelligent. I usually say it takes about 10 years to, um, uh, to start to at least be able to understand a little bit of indigenous wisdom, like a little drop of indigenous wisdom after 10 years of being somewhere. It really takes a while to acclimate and to, you know, adapt. And, and in plant genetics, it's like peoples before us who wrote about you know, on farm breeding programs and, you know, maintaining your own seed over generations in locations, it could take up to two, three decades to really, really change. I mean, basically, you know, when crops are bred, even traditionally bred cultivars, traditional breeding can take 10, 12 years. That's in a university. That's just to stabilize one line to make tam jalapeno 12 different years of crossing to create one variety of one vegetable that's stabilized in conventional breeding that's not how it it's all selections and isolations and crosses and really cool stuff so you got to figure well that took 10 years just to create a variety how many successions or accessions does it take to start to acclimate i think it really depends on what species you're working with, because if it's a species that kind of grows in your region already in a wild state, like, I don't think it's going to take too long for parsley to get, you know, to feel like it's at home in the Willamette Valley when you guys got wild umbles everywhere. So it's like, that's going to be really a quick adaptation. But when it comes to other things that aren't from your area, you know, really far away, well, now you're into it for generations, maybe decades. So that's kind of how I look at it. The seeds that we have, we started in the Gila in New Mexico, southern New Mexico, and that started in 1990. So now we're into it three decades. So some of the stuff I'm sowing, this Bolivian rainbow cross cayenne, the first generation of this ring of fire cayenne was 1990 Gila, New Mexico. And the Bolivian rainbow was as well. So we got 30, three, genera three decades. And now they're interspecies crossing after three decades. So you start to really create, well, so what are we creating now? Or what are we helping create? So this is sort of like, if you take capsicums, you say, oh, this is kind of part of the Northern Colorado Capsicum Association. Only because, hey, it's capsicums and we're growing seeds of them. And the truth is not many people grow capsicums here for seed because it's known more for New Mexico and all the way down into Mexico. So we sort of stretching the, you know, we're stretching the bioregions. Right now, the four corners are starting to move north and we can grow Hopi crops because the seasons, it's a little warmer now than it used to be 50 years ago. So this is all kind of part of the acclimation of things. I think it takes at least, at least five accessions in a biennial, which would be 10 years of growing and selecting so we have onions right now we call front range globe. It's 30 years old. It's a globe yellow that started in Oregon as a long day onion. It went all the way to Gila, turned into a short day genetics. Now it's in, in central, it's in uh, Colorado and it's a midday onion and it produces 98% bulbing. This thing is like a world traveler. I mean, I, that took 30 years, so. It depends. I love that.
carrots yeah. it really depends I love the story created. I didn't hear that. I was just saying I love the story that gets created in in the path, you know, of the plant yeah. and the, really, the different places. That's kind of what happens because it's just like when you see the rings in a tree and they're not equal over years. Well, that's sort of the genetic makeup and toughness of a seed over the years, too. So all these things keep happening over years and years and they develop this kind of elasticity where they're like, wow. I mean, you know, like what Mushroom's saying, he just throws seeds out, you know. And, I mean, where you guys live, you hit wet cycles. Your, your planting windows are rich. They're beautiful. It's, I mean, that's where I learned how to garden was Oregon. Come on back. Come on back, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> Come back to Oregon. Maybe, maybe to retire under a sequoia tree, right? That's what it sounds like a good idea. Because around here, we don't have those, you know? Um, so we work with a lot of grains here and stuff. This year, this year, we'll do about 75 different heritage wheats of different types to start seeing who, who's really good in Colorado. Turns out we actually do grow really nice grains here. Um, you know, so that's the kind of stuff we do. Just generation after generation. Carrots, we're into it. We're into it seven, eight, ten rounds on certain carrots now that are really home. Which it's really, it's, just, it's so cool. And the stuff, it's not static. It's not like it's 100% homogeneous. It's 10 years, it's 10 accessions and you got as many as you want to go. Just keep going. You just sort of knock off the runts, you rein it into a really nice cultivar, boom, you got food for people and you move on to the next. That's how we do it. I love it. And Linda, what you said you were planting seeds. What are some of the, the plants that you're into right now or some of the uh, seeds that you've been planting? Well, I haven't actually been planting any seeds. I've been doing um, compost more. Oh yeah, that's yeah. nice. Yeah. D turning compost piles or gathering and layering? Just layering them and changing them around. Yep. Adding to it, adding what mushroom does and mixing them up, mixing up. That's so beautiful. I'm interested in aloe. So I was interested in what Tara had said about aloe. I think it's very important. So yeah, we have, I don't know, 30, do we have 30 species of aloe? Anyway, we have a number of them. I don't have that many uh, aloe barbarianensis or aloe veras, but um, I'm interested in getting more. Yeah, so. you know, beautiful. And I, what I would love to see come out of this conversation that, you know, we're kind of coming towards the end of is you know let's um you, you mushroom and and rich you know give thanks for you coming on the show tonight you know we're really kind of following in your footsteps and you know we're kind of inspiring a generation that's after us and um and i really love the idea that we're you know really sharing a lot of plants with each other sharing a lot of different seeds i mean uh you all P at pcs have been really generous to us over the years and you guys have given us a lot of plants and we want to continue giving those out and you know maybe to you know to tamara you're going to be able to have you know how many kinds of aloe on your property by the end of the year you know i think it's almost a challenge right like oh shit, we got to go find as many aloes as possible um and I really and, like that. Yeah, and and Dave and Chelsea, I, I loved it how you all just kept bringing it back to, you know, we have a responsibility, those people who have been connected to the earth to tell the stories of the earth. The time is now for us to share those this these stories and be able to share, you know, the rituals that we have in the gardens and what we're planting and how we're doing it. And and you know this is this is a dem pure certified group people that are all coming together from all over the world that are doing these beautiful things for the gardens and so anybody out there who wants to learn more you know check us all out we're everywhere we want to be available we want to be able to continue educating people in a way that's inspiring in a way that's really easily accessible something that you can you know plan to seed and, and feel really good about so I just have really enjoyed this evening because it's just been so rich, uh, you know, in, in, in holistic information. Well, Marcus, uh, we've got some seeds for you too, some good food seeds coming your way that uh, 
we should have already had out, but we'll get them out here really soon. We're, we're getting it together right now. I love the sound of that. I love the sound of that. Um, can I, I would like to touch upon like one subject that you mentioned while ago about like the macrobiotic diet and like raw foods. And um, I feel like that's really important. Like raw, like the more that we can eat foods that are alive, the, the higher vi that, privation, that vibration of that plant is because we're taking in its essence. But if our food is cooked, that we will still have the nutrients, they're more dead. And so I really feel like it's really important. Like I know when I've done a raw like food diet for um, a very long length of time, I feel so happy. <laughs> I feel like I can do anything. Like I have so much energy. I barely need to sleep. Um, I just, I feel more clear in my head. But then, you know, you go back, it, it's very, it's a difficult thing to just kind of maintain continuously. But I think the more that we can put in our diet, the better. And then also just like looking at our food groups, what do we have planted? Do we have our flowers planted? Do we have like, what kind of flower do we have planted? What kind of like berries and fruit? Like what are those things that we will need to be sovereign within ourselves on our own land that you need daily? And so just kind of thinking about those things to plant and always making sure you got your trees in there. And um, like your flowers are really important. Um, like your baking kind of flowers, you know, like you always kind of like what is that protein source you also have as well and kind of like thinking what your nutrients you need and to plant accordingly so yeah just kind of wanted to mention that <laughs> I love that it always brings me back to potatoes too you know potatoes and the yams and and they're just so wonderfully carbohydrate rich and root I your days. We're, we're big on the grow. roots. We're big on the roots here. Like roots. the roots is how we live up here. I mean, we're still pulling out lots of carrots, lots of beets, lots of potatoes, the onions, the, the garlic. Those are the things that get us through the winter. So we're looking at how many more roots we can live on. You know, I, I would like to be able to grow yams. I don't see it happening in this region, but uh, anything. We can in a greenhouse and a hot house, but in Oregon, you guys can. I've seen some beautiful, yay, Rich is back on. That's awesome. Hey, Rich, I'm glad you came back on. But I've seen some great yams come out of Oregon. Hey, I'm so glad I'm back. I thought you guys are back. No doubt. Have you ever seen yams grown in your area or anywhere around? No, we're not too big on yams. I mean, it's the nights are so cold here. You really got to work it to get a yam to grow. I mean, that's one thing. You got to do it in pots and stuff. That's good. Well, you know what? We're going to, um, Kelly's going to give a, a, moon, a moon planting for the week. Yeah. Um, I, did, I did it last week. So I was like, hey, I guess we'll just go every thursday to thursday and we look have. at what the moon's doing and what's going on and sort of help align us um we had right. a really beautiful full moon and a really beautiful yeah. super moon in the last few days so i'm hoping everyone took advantage of that and got yeah. their activated yeah and as it like came into fruition now it's starting to wane and the waning time of the moon is like a really beautiful time to look at root vegetables and think about your soil and 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 energy going within you know if we're if we're wondering about how we're going to get through an emotional difficulty or a physical difficulty a waning moon is a really wonderful time to go within and do your meditation time so up, up until next Thursday, it's going to go into a half moon. Um, right now, we've got another early morning in Scorpio. So a really good time to do your fruit and veggie planting, which is super awesome. And then, uh, you know, it goes on Saturday and Sunday, it moves into Sagittarius. And that's just like, a, you know, it's the time of journey. And, and it's the time of like exploration. Like, we can't really travel right now, but maybe it's time to do a light psychedelic at home. You know, maybe it's time to do a, a journey at home or, or do your meditations as to what, what, what is it that you're going to put out on the next full moon. Um, and then into Sunday, it goes into Capricorn. We were talking about root vegetables. Like, yeah, it's a time to plant the roots. Put in your potatoes, whatever beets you haven't put in. 
onions, the alums, it's a good time to seed them, get them in your trays, even in the greenhouses for the northern areas. And then into Wednesday, it goes into Aquarius. And Aquarius is the time to like dream like all these great realities. How are we going to turn our gardens into beautiful places for us to walk? What flowers can we plant more of? Aquarius is the sign of like flowers. Let's bring in our pollinators. Let's beautify our gardens so that we want to get out there every day. So not only is our feeding our body, but it's also feeding our soul. And that brings us into the half moon of, uh, of, of next Thursday. And then, and then we'll do it again. <laughs> so your astrology for the week. <laughs> and um, on the way out, maybe each person could tell um, their ending. Um, how can we find how you? How can we find how you? How can we get a hold of your seeds? Mara, your, your beautiful medicines and you to lead us forward and information out to the people. We were talking earlier how your programs have been illegal in Russia. You've pounded through so, so much information to, to bring us here today. I'm just in so much gratitude for everybody today. How can we find all y'all? Hi. Masa Seed Foundation. Masa, Masa stands for the Mutual Admiration Seek Association. That's all of us. MasaSeedFoundation.org. Info at MasaSeedFoundation.org. But Masa Seed Foundation will get you to the website, and the website will get you to the catalog. And we're, and we're keeping on trying to revamp it and get the social systems up. There's a lot to try to do right now. Um, we got a seed growers co-op. We have 60 interested members right now into the development of a local regional seed co-op. I'm really excited. That just happened. Um, so that means backyard breeders programs and variety trial stuff. And, and then we're gonna do a CSA. We'll do a CSA, but we're gonna really encourage participatory CSA memberships so people can come and take learner share and instead of just small shares and large shares, now it's called learner's share. You can come and work in the garden and then we'll, we'll, you can get all the food and potentially it'd be nice if you pay us as well because we'll, it's, you know, the farm always needs financing. That's what happens, you know? But yeah, you can find us there. This has been really fun. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I just feel really good that we were able to jump in and wow, it's been a long time since I've seen Mushroom and Linda and, and then to see you all and it's just really beautiful. It feels really nice to be in the seed room and feel, you know, wow, I just, it's getting a little blessings from some friends far away. We're so, in the other. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, love. Love, love, love you. Yeah, love you. you too. Yeah. Mutual Admiration Seed Association. We couldn't figure it out. Originally, I wanted to call it the Abu Regional. I was calling it the Abu, we were Abu Danza. We were calling it the Abu Regional uh, Seed Project. I really liked Abu Regional because it was Aboriginal. And then I heard that Abu actually is derogatory and it would be very, it's not a very cool thing to say, especially in places like Australia to an Aboriginal. And I was like, what a bummer. I was like, I really like this name. I had no that idea. That was really that. good. It was sounding really good. Definitely. I, I'm with you on that. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, people say, you can't use it. And I had an identity crisis. And it took me like six months. And I still couldn't find a good name. And then it was like, OK, people, what's it going to be? And I was like, well, all right, Masa. Masa, interesting. I love corn. Masa, beautiful. Mutual admiration. OK, we'll do it. So Masa Seed Foundation it is. It works with PC. That sounds awesome. Masa. Yeah. Beautiful. And Mushroom and Linda, um, can you tell us about peace seeds and, and maybe peace and maybe peace seedlings? And and do you guys have a unique way of getting seeds because you don't have a website at the moment? So can you how tell can, people how to do it? How people can find your seeds, how people can find you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can find peace seeds uh, dot blogspot dot uh, peace seeds live dot blogspot dot com for the usual annual seed list as it's been for the last 20 years or something. So every year we have a new set of stuff that we put in this list and 
that's where you can find it on the computer. And for Delana and Mario, which is pseedlings.blogspot.com, uh, they also, and they have a very different seed list since we have different things we work on as a common ground. And they grow a lot more seeds. They grow a lot of do. seeds. Yeah. And that's beautiful. That's your children. And for people that don't know who Mari, for Delana's your, your child and, and they're, uh, you know, they're kind of taking on the, uh, the work and, and bringing it forward and spending every day on the field. They were gonna join us tonight, but they were working out in the field. And so that's, you know, we understand that. Um, so Peace Seedlings is where they, you know, you can find them and then you send them a check and, and that's how you, and what about your art, Mushroom? Is there a place where we can see your art? Cause you, and we haven't talked about it. We don't have time to dive, but you are a modern artist and you do paint every single day. <laughs> A, a lot of the time, there's probably there's probably about 1,700 paintings, and they're all hunging out. One, a lot of them are stacked up. So you know, one, and I just like to keep show on me painting. Your, show me your blog art. What? You oh, can see his art. You can see the art on piece. What was it? <laughs> I don't know who did it. Art, I think it's called. We don't know. Alcatular <laughs> art, right? And you can get, and there's uh, awesome. every 30 or 40, every every couple of months, we change the program of what's available to look at. That's Great. awesome. And we, we have some of your videos on our YouTube channel if people want to see more about your work in the farm and everything. So people can look at the Dragonfly Earth Medicine YouTube channel. And the Dem Pure. And the Dem Pure one is starting, but there's not as much on there yet. We're getting so. it out there. Um, and Chelsea and, and Dave. How um, do people? Putting up some really beautiful photos on social media and stuff. How do, how do people get to you? Um, so check out the farm. We're at sweetlyorganicfarm.com. And um, I'm probably most interactive on our Instagram, which is the OG plant. And yeah, the OG plant Instagram. And if you want to hit me up there, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm addicted. So I, I'll, uh, I'll get back to you right away. You can pick my brain and I can tell you a million things not to do. <laughs> That's awesome. I really love how you've just grown so much food over the years and you just have also so much beautiful herb around you and, and you really have, you know, such amazing flavors and, and big love to you and your crew, you know, to everyone that you work with and you have a long time crew in your field. And I know it's not just you and Chelsea, holding it down and I just want to give a lot of love to the whole the whole sweet leaf family out there and you guys have been really done a lot for Eugene and and, and the uh, amount the of community. people that you all have fed and the amount of food that you all have given away into the Oregon Country Fair kitchen for so many decades you all have been like giving away food like all of that has been incredibly important and 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 you've been really feeding people for a long time I just appreciate you guys so much Tamara how can people find you we love you and we think we you're wonderful. You. We appreciate your kindness and your gentleness and, and just everything that you do. You just, we really appreciate having you in our lives. And to be around this lady is awesome. She's funny and savvy and smart and amazing. Girl, I love you. Thanks for coming on tonight. Oh, yeah, it's been fun. Thank you for having me on tonight. Um, Heal Thyself Gardens, we're at eight, or it's like, we have a website up right now, heal-thyself-gardens.com. It's in transition, we haven't finished it yet. You can see some of the products we have available, um, but you cannot order directly from the site yet. And that's only mainly because we're in, we're in a big transition right now. We've gone from being in this other market <laughs> with, you know, wholesaling cannabis and making medicines for like dispensaries and family to now like we're working on our micro business out here in California. And that's taken me the last three years to do because I'm having to build like a manufacturing space out here, get the roads, you know, commercially up to standard for with all they want. And it's been a lot of process, but um, through it, you know, it's like helped me realize exactly what the priorities are. Like, am I just gonna grow two, you know, giant fields of cannabis with a few herbs in that? Or where's my passion at? Where is Hill Thyself Gardens? What is like, we want to 
be about empowering people to learn how to like take care of themselves, like be your own doctor. This isn't just about like plants and food. This is also, like I said, energetically, like how do you heal yourself? And so that's what we're, we're working on and also working later on down the road, creating a place where people can come and be in the gardens and meditate and heal. And so right now you can just find us a lot on Instagram at Heal Thyself Gardens. And if you see any of the products that I'm making, I'm making a lot of antiviral um, medication, like medicines right now. And that's mainly just local that I have been or if anyone's work, um, reaching out. And so I will, will probably, I believe will be up and running, at least with the products by the summer. And so then we'll be able to host all our stuff. And I do CBD right now as we're waiting on our cannabis licensing. And also, you know, sometimes I do like CBD better. So I'm just like working on the medicines right now and we're rebuilding the gardens. And so, yeah, that's where we are. So it's like, it's kind of fun to visit us on our Instagram because you can see our, where we're starting again and like where we're going. So, yeah. <laughs> And you like to make cash too, so big, you know, oh, so yeah. for our marketing yeah. page, you know, we should just say, you know, we love hash, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, hash. you've done a lot of work with Amanda and Brandon, you yes. know, over the years, a, a lot of our crew is big into the hash, so. Yeah. Um, I love making hash, it's super fun, and I feel really honored to have, like, really amazing hash makers around me, and, um, yeah, it's definitely something I'll be like sharing more of as I get more comfortable right now. I'm like, oh, here's C, you know, and, um, but it's fun and I love it. And I'm, yeah, it's definitely becoming an obsession. So, yay. <laughs> right on. Marcus. And what's been going on with you? You guys cut out there. Was that to me? Yeah. What, what are you what working are you, on these days? What do you, I know you're, you're got a lot on the go always, but what's happening? And you've been putting a lot of stuff up on your YouTube channel, getting that live going. Yeah. I got this channel back that had been hacked and, and taken away and all the videos on it had been deleted and erased. And I just sort of pushed through that and didn't really react to it too much, but YouTube, you know, everyone says YouTube super against uh, cannabis information, but this website is about 98% cannabis related uh, this YouTube channel that we're on right now and um, YouTube gave it back and then they put all the well, most of the videos they made a mistake but they I got like almost 900 of my videos back and I had about a thousand sixteen so that was that was really nice and then uh, working with uh, Whistler Technologies you know turning people on to uh, water extraction um, large-scale uh, water extraction for bigger farms or big, you know even craft processors or larger processors an alternative to uh using all the different you know uh, ethanols and hydrocarbons and co2 and whatnot that it's uh it's just another alternative that's water and ice and everyone seems to like it so it's like why not make it accessible for you know some of these companies that are out there trying to make products Make sure there's a good one out there. Water extracted is a favorite of many. That is for sure. Kind of a no-brainer. But uh, yeah, that's about it. And taking that's tons of beautiful. tons of walks with my family in the in the forest in the back here. Nice, nice. And uh, Daniel and British, and we've talked to recently, and they've been transforming their land as well in central yeah. British Columbia. And it's going to be really exciting to see what happens with them. Um, so yeah, Whistler, Whistler Technologies, check it out on Instagram. You guys are always putting out some really beautiful uh, hash there and different options. And it's just been really blowing my mind. But this evening has been really amazing. We're going to wrap it up. Um, Go put your hands in the dirt, buy some seeds, grow some plants, smoke some ganja, feel good, reach out to a neighbor. You know, I, I think instead of hand sanitizer, we should all walk around with buckets of compost and put our hands in the compost. That's oh, gonna man. be my, you know, my better choice. But uh, Mushroom, you know, you haven't done this before. Thank you so much for showing up, everyone for being here. Um, I'm really thankful for this opportunity. And I hope that all of y'all are gonna come back and anybody wanting to learn more, check into the Dempure Collective, Dempure Certified. 
farmers out there doing the good work of the land and of the communities and of the people. And again, you know, just like we started, let's really live our life in gratitude, take every moment that we can to, to really look at all of the things that we have to have gratitude for. Go build some birdhouses, go plant some trees. We love you guys. Take care of yourselves. Gardens. Be well. Don't worry. We'll make it through. It's all going to be okay. We're going to be. We're going to be making it. We got each other. We're Blessings. doing this. Love. Uh -oh. Thank you all so much for the evening. Uh oh, thank you.